be the Department of Defense won't give a Hummer, it'll give an all-electric or something like that. That's not its mission. We all agreed early on in this process that we cannot uh, focus on anything except national security and combat effectiveness, combat effectiveness and efficiency. And oh, by the way, in our deliberations and in our analysis, we found that uh, efficiency has a direct positive correlation to combat effectiveness. Energy, and secu energy security and climate goals should be clearly and fully integrated into the national security and military planning processes. That's on, underway. There's a quadrennial defense review that's uh, ongoing now. The ser <coughs> services and the Department of Defense will report out to Congress next February on the, their deliberations. And for the first time in a substantive way, both energy security and the consequences of climate change are going to be factored into this quadrennial defense review. Here's a quote from one of our uh, esteemed colleagues. It was uh, uh, retired Admiral Dick Truly, former astronaut, administrator of uh, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and the former uh, lab director of the National Renewable Energy Lab. Takes technology, but more importantly, most importantly, it takes public knowledge about energy use and how important it is to us to resolve it. And to resolve it in the context of a world that is uh, threatened by the consequences of climate change. That's a shot of our Earth rising over the lunar surface on one of the Apollo missions uh, 40 years ago. We just celebrated that a week or, or, or two weeks ago. And it was an unbelievable achievement, not just for the United States, but for all of mankind. <clears throat> we have faced these challenges in the past and we have uh, done some amazing thing as a country. And one of my favorite stories from my parents' generation is been, and, and a little bit from my own generation is uh, World War II and how the United States rose up to the challenge, every citizen, in terms of victory gardens, saving critical materials, contributing to the war effort because we knew it, we had to do it and we did it and we did it willingly and the prosperity in the security of the United States since then is a direct result. So that's the bottom line. This is our wonderful nation and uh, we're pretty good at getting stuff done and we need to get this one done. Without uh, any questions up to this point, I'm going to turn it over right away to uh, Matt and then uh, we'll, we want to hear from you what's on your mind, questions and, and observations about what we're saying. Matt. I think a sailor know how to do knots. Yeah. <laughs> Rather, we didn't have any knots with this thing here. Right. Well, thanks. Thanks to all of you for coming. Um, I, I'm going to be brief. Uh, my role here is as a discussant. I guess it's it's no secret that I'm also representing a younger generation, um, and and I'm actually. Uh, from the great state of California, and uh, I grew up as a, a Reagan baby, um, and, and Ronald Reagan is indeed my political hero in a lot of ways. Um, but I think there was one thing he was wrong about, and that was when he said that um, uh, the problem is not cars, it's trees. Trees produce more emissions into the atmosphere than cars do. Ronald Reagan was wrong about that. Um, the science does indicate, and, and you know, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of debate still on the margins of this, but the science indicates that the problem we have today of global climate change is fundamentally about carbon emissions. Uh, it's burning fossil fuel, whether you're talking about an internal combustion engine in a car, or you're talking about uh, factories, or you're talking about power plants. That's what's producing uh, the emissions in our atmosphere that is causing the climate change. And the truth of the matter is um, some of it probably isn't reversible, no matter what we do. Um, some of it has, is a ball that has started rolling. Uh, once those polar ice caps start to melt, there's less ice surface on the poles to reflect the hot rays from the sun, which means the oceans are absorbing more heat, which means their temperature is growing and water volume is growing and on and on and on. Um, but I'm not here to talk about the science. I'm here to talk about how we respond, uh, not in my case from a military perspective, but from a political perspective. Uh, I work with a group of very senior uh, distinguished officials in Washington um, 
I, I work for a group called Partnership for a Secure America, which is headed by uh, former Representative Lee Hamilton uh, and former Senator Warren Rudman, and is a group of two dozen very distinguished Democrats and Republicans. And these folks have come together uh, specifically to talk about the issue of climate and security uh, because their view, and I share this view, is that it has become a national security threat and that as with other national security and foreign policy challenges, it's something that Americans have to address in a bipartisan way and in a national way. The problem is our approach to this issue has to date been a political approach. It's been environmentalists on one side and business on the other side, Democrats on one side, Republicans on the other side. And we're dealing with a global challenge here. This is, this is the classic tragedy of the commons. One person does one thing, one country does one thing, and everyone else suffers the consequences. And here we are in the United States waking up to something that Europe has known about for 20 years, they'll tell us, maybe longer than that. Uh, but then the Indians and the Chinese don't get it. They're just building their economy. They're just burning as much as they can. They're slashing and burning forests and all of that. Um, but it's a tragedy of the commons. The end of the day, this is one of those, the collective solution, everyone working together has got to be greater than the sum of the parts, otherwise we're going to lose this fight. So let me give you guys just an overview of the landscape of what the solution looks like from a political perspective. There are two basic categories of how you respond to the challenge of climate change. One of them is mitigation, which is you try to reduce the impacts, the, the actual change in the global temperature and the global climate, the flooding, the droughts, et cetera, as much as we can. And the other one is adaptation, which is you say, well, a certain amount of this can't be prevented. It's going to happen. How do we be prepared for it on a global basis so that we can, we can manage the consequences? As far as mitigation, uh, the United States can do two things. One of them is very painful. The other one is probably a little bit less painful and probably more of an opportunity. The painful part is we've got to reduce our own emissions. We've got to do that for a lot of reasons. Um, I'm certainly open to your thoughts about, about the consequences of this, but, but the first reason is that the United States can't demonstrate any kind of real global leadership. In other words, if the problem today is coming from the fact that uh, China's population of a billion people is getting closer and closer and closer to a U.S. lifestyle, a U.S. level of energy consumption in their living, then you're going to have effectively five United Stateses over there on the Yellow River in China. Well, that's a real mess from the standpoint of climate. So uh, in order for us to, to take diplomatic leadership on this issue, we're going to have to do something ourselves. We're going to have to demonstrate, well, we're willing to cut back, we're willing to take a lead. Uh, the same could be said for India, for Brazil, for the other major emitters of carbon uh, in the world. Uh, the second, the, 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 the other step, uh, and, and by the way, on this, on this issue of reducing emissions, we're essentially talking about what's been described as uh, cap and trade or cap and tax. Uh, these are painful concepts because they impose costs on the American economy, uh, and there really isn't a right answer about how to do it. Um, the second pathway is innovation and technological efficiency. The idea of finding new solutions that are uh, that, that take advantage of, of America's great problem-solving ability and America's uh, ability to innovate and actually make us market leaders in the world. So instead of Denmark uh, selling 70% of the wind turbines that are sold on the global market, the United States gets a piece of that action. We get maybe first mover action when it comes to electrically powered vehicles. Uh, we're moving in that direction with the, the new GM Chevy Volt, uh, the electric powered car, um, and there are other opportunities like that. So those are the two baskets uh, as far as response, um, as, far as, as far as mitigation. Just on adaptation, on sort of what do we do on a political level to deal with a warming world or a climate change world, uh, this is another really difficult one because it's about money. The United States is going to have to be out there with Europe, uh, with uh, the other developed countries of the world, uh, Japan in particular, and we're going to have to provide resources so that the Ethiopias of the world and the Sudans of the world uh, and the Rwandas of the world don't become failed states. They don't become Afghanistans when they undergo climate change. Because if Africa experiences the, the 5 to 10 degree temperature increase that it's expected to experience in the next 50 years, that means the Sahara Desert is essentially going to take over the continent of Africa. If everyone in Africa is living in a desert, you can bet that there are going to be more ethnic cleansings, there's going to be more mass migration, there's going to be more chaos. So, so the question is, what's cheaper? Send in the Marines every time, call in the cavalry, or invest in capacity building in Africa so that they can better endure those kinds of climate crises. That's what I'm talking about. But it's political will. We've got to be able to get that money from somewhere if we're going to spend it on our own security, 